If a 60% free throw shooter takes 10 shots, what is the probability that it makes exactly seven of them? To answer questions like that, we can use this formula for the binomial distribution. And this doesn't just apply to free throws. It applies whenever there's a repeating process where you could put the outcomes into two categories. That's where the by in binomial comes from. And that kind of situation is pretty common considering it encompasses all yes or no questions. The formula looks a bit scary, but by the end of this video, we'll make sense of it. And hopefully it's pretty along the way. Okay, we're gonna start with one blob. It's programmed to make it 60% of the time, so what's the probability that it would make one out of one? This question feels a little bit silly. We don't need any fancy formulas to know that the answer is 60%, but it's a starting point to build on. Another silly starting question is, what's the probability it makes zero of one? It's the other 40% of the time. 60% is the same as three out of five, so we can visualize the probabilities by looking at five blobs and having three of them make it and two of them miss. Okay, now what if the blobs take two shots each? It'll be helpful to have more blobs to look at here, so let's make this into a square of blobs and have the new blobs also take their first shot, again with three out of five of them making it. And then they can all take a second shot, which means we now have to ask about making zero, one, or two of two shots. You might notice this isn't exactly random, but for the moment, we're just focusing on making a clean diagram. Four of the 25 blobs were unlucky enough to miss both the first and the second shot. From this, we can say that a 60% free throw shooter has a 16% probability of missing both shots. And this is the same number we would have gotten by multiplying the probabilities of the individual shot outcomes. The probability of missing the first shot is 40%, then 40% of those 40% also missed the second shot, and 40% of 40% comes out to 16%. Next, for the blobs that made one shot, we have two groups. One group of six made the first and missed the second shot, and six out of 25 is 24%. Again, we can multiply the individual probabilities to check that they come out the same, and indeed, 60% for the make times 40% for the miss comes out to 24%. The second group is pretty much the same, except the make and the miss come in the opposite order. And adding these together, we get a 48% probability for making one of two shots. And for the ones that made both shots, there's again just one group, and we can fill in the numbers in the same way. And all these probabilities add up to 100%, which is a great sign. We're gonna add a third shot in a moment here, but it might already be possible to guess at the pattern. So try pausing and see if you can predict what it's gonna look like after three shots. Okay, for the third shot, it'll be useful to have even more blobs to look at, so let's make this a 3D grid and have the new blobs take their first two shots. With three shots, the top three layers made it and the bottom two layers missed. It's a little bit difficult to see what's going on inside this cube, so let's pull it apart into sections and organize it by outcome. Okay, so again, there's only one way to miss all of the shots. Eight of the 125 blobs ended up in this category, which gives us a probability of 6.4% for that outcome. And again, we could get this same number by multiplying the probabilities of the individual misses. Next, for one make out of three shots, there are three ways to get it. The first way in this list is miss, miss, then make. 12 of the 125 blobs had this outcome, which gives us a 9.6% probability. Multiplying the individual probabilities looks like this. The thing to notice here is that all three of these groups have the same number of blobs in them. The probability is the same for each of them. We don't care about the order of makes and misses, we just care about how many there are. And order also doesn't matter for multiplication, so each of these comes out to the same 9.6%. Which means we don't have to go through all the different ways of making one of three. We can just calculate the probability for one of them, then multiply that result by three to get the overall probability of making one out of three shots. And this idea will come in handy for looking at two out of three. Just like before, there are three groups and they each have the same probability, which is 14.4% each for an overall probability of 43.2% to make two out of three. And for three out of three, there's just one way with a probability of 21.6%. So we have this pattern of counting the number of specific ways to make a certain number of shots and then multiplying that by the probability for each of those specific ways, which again are always the same. And that's exactly what this formula does. This bit here stands for the number of ways to get k makes out of n total shots. It's called the binomial coefficient. 
in this example we just went through, the binomial coefficient is 1, 3, 3, or 1, depending how many makes we're asking about. We don't yet have a great way of finding it for other numbers of attempts and makes, so most of the rest of this video is going to focus on that. And the second part is multiplying the probabilities of the individual shots. This little p is the probability of a success, so 60% in this case, and 1 minus the little p is the probability of a failure, so 40%. And if we write these calculations so far using exponents, you can start to see how they have the same shape as the formula. So this formula has a lot of pieces and a lot of letters, so depending how much practice you've had with algebra recently, it might feel a bit overwhelming. If so, I can guarantee you're not alone. And it might be a good exercise to pause, take out a piece of paper, and plug the numbers into the formula for each case yourself. Now, all the math nerds out there are going to yell at me with good reason, if I don't mention that this formula only makes sense if the shots are independent of each other. Which might not be true. For example, missing the first shot might make you nervous, changing the probability of making the next shot, making things way more complicated. For the rest of this video though, we're going to assume that the interactions between shots are minor enough that we can ignore them. And these blobs don't even have the memory of a goldfish, so every shot is a fresh start. That might sound lazy, but even if you care about making the most accurate model possible, it's usually good to start with a simpler model, then test it to see how it performs, then add complexity if you need to. Alright, so now we have the overall structure of the formula figured out, but we're not quite ready to answer that original question about making 7 of 10 shots. We can plug in the numbers, but it's not clear just yet how we count how many different ways there are to arrange 7 makes and 3 misses. Okay, let's start fresh, forgetting about the probabilities, and just focus on counting the ways each number of shots could be made, which again is called the binomial coefficient. Starting with a blob that hasn't taken any shots yet, there's only one possibility, where it's made zero shots. When the blob takes a shot, there are two possible branches reality can take. One where the shot goes in, and one where the shot misses. And this is true every time we add a shot. For the second shot, these two possibilities split into four possibilities one possible way of missing both shots, two possible ways of making one of the two, and one way of making both. So just like before, we have this one, two, one pattern after two shots. The neat thing about this table is that both ways to make one out of two shots are tracked together. The tree of blobs over on the right tracks every single possible order of makes and misses, but the number of blobs we have to draw is going to double every time we add a shot. Since we only care about the total number of makes, lumping them together in a table is good enough and it makes the tracking a lot easier. And adding a third shot, we get the same pattern we found before, with 1, 3, 3, and 1 ways to get each total of successes. But now it's going to be a lot easier to add a fourth shot. We can just continue the pattern of pushing the numbers down the table and combining them. So for four shots, it looks like there's still just one way to miss them all, four ways to make one, six ways to make two, four ways to make three, and one way to make all four. And we can just continue this pattern to find any number we need. So now we could use the binomial distribution formula to answer this question from the very beginning of the video. What is the probability a 60% free throw shooter will make 7 of 10? We can look at this table to see that there are 120 ways to make 7 out of 10 shots. And the probability for each of those ways happening is 0.6 to the 7th power for the 7 makes, times 0.4 to the 3rd power for the 3 misses. That comes out to a pretty small number, but if you combine all 120 different ways to make 7, they add up to about 21.5%. So that's our answer. This pattern is known as Pascal's triangle. It's usually written like this. The numbers on the outside of each row are 1, and each number in the middle is found by adding the two numbers above it. So we now have a way to get this binomial coefficient for any numbers. But it's still a lot of work, especially if the numbers are big, so it would be nice if there were a faster way to do it. The good news is there's a formula for the binomial coefficient. The bad news is it looks like this. Those exclamation points are called factorials. If you haven't seen them before, I think it's easiest to explain them with examples. 1 factorial is 1. 2 factorial is 2 times 1. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. And 4 factorial is, say it with me, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. You multiply the number by 1 less than itself, then by 2 less, and so on, all the way down to 1. So to say this formula in words, we take the factorial of the total number of shots, and then we divide by the factorial of the number of makes, and we also divide by the factorial of the number of misses. Which reminds me, 0 factorial is defined as 1. 
that can feel a bit weird at first, so I'll link to some videos about it, but I figured I should mention it because it's required for this formula to work when we have zero makes or zero misses. Anyway, with this formula, we can find the binomial coefficient without having to look at Pascal's triangle. But it's probably not super clear yet why this formula works. To make sense of it, let's zoom out a bit and think about counting arrangements in general. We'll start out with one object. How many ways are there to arrange this one object? There's just one, I guess. There it is. If we had a second object, we can do it in one of two ways. We can put it to the left or to the right. So by adding a second object, we multiply the number of possible arrangements by two. To add a third object, we can take the previous orderings one at a time and add the new object to three different places, left, middle, or right. So by adding a third object, we multiply the number of possible arrangements by three. You might be starting to see a pattern, but let's do one more. If we add a fourth object, there are four places we can put it. So by adding a fourth object, we multiply the number of possible arrangements by four. The number of possible arrangements is already starting to get out of hand, but thankfully we can see the pattern now and don't have to list them all out anymore. If you want to arrange n unique objects, there are n factorial ways to do it. And that's where the n factorial in the numerator of this formula comes from. Now is a good time to pause and make sure that n factorial in the numerator makes sense. If it doesn't, the part that comes next certainly won't either. All that's left is to figure out the factorials in the bottom of the formula. These let us account for situations where the objects aren't unique, but instead fall into two different categories, like makes and misses. Remember, that's what binomial means. We're gonna look at some examples to help this make sense, but the quick explanation is that since we don't care about the order of identical objects, n factorial is counting orderings we don't care about. So we have to divide by the number of ways to arrange the objects in each category. So for example, let's focus on the situation with three blobs. And we'll take the perspective that we only care about whether the blobs are wearing hats or not. Two of the three blobs are wearing hats, so if we just care about hat or no, half of the orderings are the same. Half of them have the wizard hat first, and half of them have the propeller hat first. So we should divide by the two ways of ordering the two hats. Or to write it in a way that looks like the binomial coefficient formula, we could divide by the two factorial ways to order the two hats, and also the one factorial ways to order the one blob with no hat. This example has pretty small numbers, so the pattern might not be super clear yet. So let's run through some examples with four blobs. We have four factorial total ways to arrange the blobs, but if we're just worried about the hats, we'll again divide by the two factorial ways to order the hats, but we'll also divide by the two factorial ways to order the non-hats. And this gets us to six orderings of hats and non-hats. Okay, let's do one more example, this time with three of the four blobs wearing hats. We still have four factorial ways to arrange the blobs, and focusing on the hat or not hat orderings, we can divide by the three factorial ways to arrange the hats, which gets us to four. For these examples with small numbers, it wouldn't be too hard to just list out all the possibilities and count them. But this pattern where we take the factorial of the total number of objects, then divide by the factorials of the numbers in each group we're focusing on, lets us find the binomial coefficient for any numbers. Imagine trying to do this by hand for the seven out of 10 example. This is just a small taste of the area of math that deals with counting how to group or arrange things, which is called combinatorics. So that's something you could look up if you're interested in hearing more about this kind of thing. So we've done a bunch of theorizing about how this formula should be able to calculate the probabilities of a free throw shooter hitting a certain number of shots. Before we're satisfied with it though, we should check that it works by testing it against some randomized results. Let's test it with 10,000 blobs, since that's a number that only almost breaks my computer. All right, it's pretty close. It's not exact, but we shouldn't expect it to be exact, even with 10,000 blobs. And we did get this one blob that didn't make a single shot. Poor little buddy. Let's let it keep trying while we summarize what we've learned about this formula. For repeatable independent events, whose results can be categorized as a yes or a no, this formula gives the probability that you get a certain number of yeses or nos in a certain number of trials. And of course, you need to know the probability of an individual yes or no. 
a lot of work goes into these videos and we're committed to providing them for free. If you happen to be in a position where you're able to give, you can help us produce more of these videos by supporting on Patreon. But even if you're not able to provide financial support, we appreciate very much that you watched all the way to the end. And we'll see you next time.